Hello, and welcome to the second episode of Salon B, the new podcast from Berghahn Books. I'm Elizabeth Geist, Digital Marketing Coordinator at Berghahn, and I'm happy that you could join us at the beginning of this exciting project. Historically, Salons followed Horace's aim of poetry either to instruct or delight, and we hope to do both as we bring you a gathering of academics and writers from a wide range of disciplines to discuss their work, read excerpts, and talk about their academic life, all tied to a different monthly theme. This episode is themed around youth and features urban teenagers, East German comic books, and the cinema of boyhood. To begin today's salon, our senior humanities editor Chris Chappelle talks to Philip Schroeder about his book Bishkek Boys, Neighborhood Youth and Urban Change in Kyrgyzstan's Capital. The discussion includes the function of controlled violence as an integrative force, what masculinity meant for the boys he studied, and how life has changed in Kyrgyzstan since he completed his fieldwork. Hello, I'm Chris Chappell, and I'm here with Berkhan author Philip Schroeder. Philip, welcome to Salon B. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. So your book is, uh, it's an ethnographic uh, study of Bishkek, which is the capital of Kyrgyzstan, the former, uh, former Soviet Republic. So I guess, in the broad strokes, tell us about the Bishkek boys who are at the center of your study. Yeah, um, of course. So for me, uh, it's very weird, actually, to, to be honest, to talk about Bishkek boys uh, in terms of boys anymore, because um, I have conducted the fieldwork about 14 years ago. Yeah, now, mm -hmm. So these are not boys anymore. <laughs> right. Um, so these are grown men now, but at the time they were um, actually in their teenage to early 20, uh, 20s and they were inhabiting uh, a former socialist neighborhood uh, close to the center of Bishkek. And that's where they went about their youth lives, uh, studying or not so much studying. That's, that's how I tried to understand how their life worlds evolved, what is important to them. Uh, in terms of social ties, because the overarching topics uh, of the book are identity and integration and how these two things match up with one another or how they well diverge. And so for these, for these young men, young men at the time, um, what were kind of the salient features of their identity that uh, you, know, you talk about in the book? Um, I think it's interesting because you have to say that uh, there was one salient component that was nostalgic. Mm -hmm. which uh, is how the neighborhood used to be run, how the neighborhood used to align with other neighborhoods, how the neighborhood was in conflict with other neighborhoods, especially the one from right across the street um, with um, which they had, you know, these symbolic kind of street fights um, every day uh, up until the early 2000s. Yeah? And that was kind of the salient nostalgic part. And the salient present part was that this um, identification and integration within this very narrowly defined local community was waning, yeah? it was fading out because uh, to a large degree to the, uh, for the reason of these street fights uh, having stopped. Yeah? So this kind of uh, violence was an integrator yeah, to them. And integrator among, like within their neighborhood or within yeah. kind of Bishkek society yeah. more broadly? I think actually both, yeah, because in, in anthropology, we have this beautiful term of cross-cutting ties, yeah, which means mm -hmm. you're somehow connected to someone else. But in the course of time, this social tie might change. Yeah? So it might it makes you from being an enemy to maybe being a friend or the other way around. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And so they were also integrated with the um, other neighborhoods uh, during the time of these fights in terms of an, an opposition that was integrative. That was the one dynamic that was most graspable, uh, most palpable at the time of my fieldwork, because that was the fading out part. Yeah. So looking back, they said we used to fight, but we all used to be Bishkekians and Bishkek boys. Yeah. Uh, of course, you were from that neighborhood. I was from that neighborhood, but still, at least we were among us. That was kind of mm -hmm. the story. Yeah. You begin the book by describing a pretty vivid uh, episode that happens on a basketball court. If I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, yes. and it's a, it's a, it's a fight of some kind. So, I mean, what's the, what's the nature of the violence there? It doesn't sound like, like people aren't getting killed, right? No, no, pe people were not getting killed over these kind of things. Um, it is interesting to see because this violence was uh, not only sporadic, 
but it was also very controlled. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. regulated. Yeah, and um, again, there was this nostalgic component about the violence and the present day component at the time of this violence. And nostalgic one was that there were very clear rules, such as you would fight until the first blood. Maybe I don't know, running nose. Yeah, I don't know, broken leg, something like this. But that's when it ended. Drawing on this kind of picture, they they were criticizing also present day. Uh, developments in Bishkek, yeah, because uh, it was a lot of, uh, in their words, yeah, rural migrants coming to the city and they were not knowledgeable about these rules, they were not respecting these rules. And so they were complaining about violence going out of hand, yeah, mm -hmm. from their point of view, but still they were not very much affected by it, actually. It mm -hmm. was rather the discourse about uh, this than the actual experience of it. Yeah, and, and so this is all against the backdrop of larger changes in Kyrgyz society and within kind of the, the social fabric of Bishkek. Yes, yes. Yeah, so like what's going on there? You, you mentioned the rural <laughs> urban. <laughs> well, the, what, what was going on there, I think, um, in the end are, are three major developments yeah, that were affecting this dynamic in this very particular community. Um, the one dynamic was migration, yes, yeah, so after the mm -hmm. end of the Soviet Union and with industrial decline and large-scale unemployment, what you could notice is that uh, there was a huge or large-scale rural to urban migration. The, just to give you some numbers that are also in the book, is that towards the end of the 1980s, during the time of the last Soviet census of Frunze, which was the former Soviet name of Bishkek, you had about, uh, you had below 700,000 inhabitants, yeah? At the time of my field work, about 20 years later, you could say, you already had an informal 1.5 million. The city doubled, yeah. And that was, of course, affecting also this neighborhood, this very particular one where I conducted my field work. But not so much in the sense that there was kind of a stereotypical rural poor coming into this neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Because the second process that was related to migration was the process of liberalization. Yeah? So I had the privatization of formal state um, property, yeah, including the real estate market. Just one dynamic that played into this was that uh, the parents um, of my Bishkek boys at the time, they were privatizing their former Soviet apartments during the 1990s, maybe for a couple of hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. While those who moved in around the time of my field work, they were purchasing an apartment in between $25,000 for a one-room apartment and up to eighty, ninety thousand dollars for a three-room apartment. So you also not only had a mobility that went from a rural place to an urban place, but you also had kind of a gentrification that resembled this uh, economic divide. The, the neighborhood was was a so-called micro region, yeah, mm -hmm. which, which in technical terms would be uh, prefabricated uh, cement blocks yeah, that mm -hmm. were put uh, onto one another, yeah, and um, nine stories high because of anti-earthquake regulations, you could not mm -hmm. build high in, in most parts of Bishkek at that time in the 1970s when it was built. So the inter inter interesting part about this is that gentrification would only be visible from inside these apartments, yeah? because the outside would stay the regular socialist gray because no one felt responsible to beautify, so, that's how you say it locally, to beautify the neighborhood. Yeah. So there's this very kind of utilitarian brutalist Yes, aspect yes, on the yes. outside. Yes, you have um, several blocks that all face, uh, where well, the entries always face one common yard, yeah, and so you had a delineation of yards that compose uh, this micro region neighborhood. The economic character of the neighborhood changes a lot as part of that liberalization process? Yes, it's, yeah, that's an interesting question because of course the people remain the same. Yeah? So uh, uh -huh. who, who used to be a teacher during the Soviet era, just for example, yeah, uh, probably remains a teacher or remained in fact yeah, a teacher during the Soviet era, uh, mm -hmm. post-Soviet era. But of course uh, the, the reputation of the profession, the salary, uh, what you could do with that salary, of course this changed yeah, significantly. Mm -hmm because uh, being a teacher during the Soviet era guaranteed you a solid income, it guaranteed you uh, prestige uh, among your, your neighbors, yeah, for example. And so uh, a colleague of mine uh, also called this kind of uh, 
people the dispossessed of the post-Soviet era. We couldn't say middle class because there were no classes during the Soviet <laughs> sure. era, but yeah, of course. who were kind of in the middle of the society. Uh, in, in mm -hmm. The boys, my, my boys of that neighborhood, they were used mostly from these kind of families. Yeah? So we're not talking about elites, but we're also not talking about the very urban poor. We're talking about something that they refer to themselves as a lower middle class. The boys that you were looking at, were they ethnically Kyrgyz? Yes, most of them were ethnically Kyrgyz. Mm -hmm. um, some of them were ethnically Russian. Mm -hmm. um, but what united them was that they perceived to be um, kind of jointly together, yeah, originating from that very particular neighborhood. Mm -hmm. uh, although that did not make them equal or that ne did not necessarily make them friends. That's what led me in the end to, to define these kind of relationships as acquaintances. So across this ethnic divide or not, yeah, they were acquaintances, but uh, they were not really friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But they were again united in the opposition to everything that was rural at the time. Because it seemed inauthentic, because it did, it did it dilute kind of a sense of order that they had from the previous era? Yes, very much, yeah, and in, in many ways actually, yeah, because one way was uh, simply language, yeah, because um, growing up in in, in Frunze and during the Soviet era and in Bishkek uh, during the 1990s, you basically spoke Russian uh, at school. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you were ethnic Kyrgyz, most probably you also spoke Russian at home. Kyrgyz was marginalized as the language of um, family upbringing, but mostly as the language of uh, the non-urban spaces yeah, of the country. Mm -hmm. And so what came into Bishkek with this rural to urban migration was also a Kyrgyzification, if you want to say it in that mm -hmm. way, in terms of language. And then also there was this yeah, ideological classic distinction that, that reverberated between uh, urban civilization and cosmopolitanism uh, mm -hmm. against kind of a rural nationalism and uh, inverted commas backwardness. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and um, so... In that sense, the rural coming to the city was an urban antipode, yeah, you could actually say. Yeah? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And another, another colleague of mine yeah, framed that, I think, very nicely through the, the words of, of uh, an interlocutor she had during her fieldwork in Almaty in Kazakhstan. And um, this interlocutor, he described it as the village being the soul of a nation. Mm -hmm. and um, the city being the heart of a nation. Yeah? So the two belong together, but um, if they overlap and they coalesce, yeah, um, it's not necessarily healthy yeah, for the right. organism of a society. That's what's kind of behind this metaphor. Yeah? You talk about the, the kind of the, the cosmopolitan character of the city. You, you know, in the Soviet era, there was at least kind of a nominal cosmopolitanism or, or like a socialist exactly. internationalism. Mm -hmm. And is that sense, does that descend from that or are these two different kind of things or what's going on there? No, that, that, that uh, certainly descends from that. Yeah, because mm -hmm. I mean, um, if you just look again uh, at the um, evolution of, of Bishkek yeah, through uh, the lens of this or through the prism of this neighborhood, yeah, you could see that the Russian and the Kyrgyz neighbors, yeah, they went to the same kindergarten. They saw each other every day in the yard. They went to mm -hmm. the same school. Maybe even they went to the same university. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and because the, the Russians so um, successfully rejected learning Kyrgyz, yeah? <laughs> uh, even after the end of the Soviet Union, the language of their international communication, if you want to say, and if you sure. want to stress the, the ethnic level, uh, was Russian, yeah, necessarily. And because Russian just had um, a very different functionality, yeah? if you look at, at the use of the language, yeah, definitely until the end of the 1990s, Kyrgyz had more of a symbolic uh, value, yeah, in, mm -hmm. in terms of carrying um, ethnic heritage, yeah, in, in terms of still in the constitution until the present day, yeah? Kyrgyz is the government language and Russian is the official language. Up to you to decipher, yeah, what that's that is. That's really, actually. yeah, right, right, right. That's interesting. So, but, um, and, and then, I mean, now the development, I think it's especially interesting with what happens with language yeah, in, in, in Kyrgyzstan because you can clearly see that, that Kyrgyz, uh, rightfully so also, you can say, has gained yeah, um, the upper hand even in uh, the official terminology. 
The book is called Bishkek Boys. They're basically all young men. You know, talk a bit about their boyness or, you know, kind of <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what masculinity means for, for these fellows, kind of how it articulates itself. Usually what defines boyness, yeah, or, or, or this kind of uh, adolescence, yeah, if you want to say, mm -hmm. is what you do. Uh, what they did was they, hang, they, they hung around in the yard, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why did they hang around in the yard? Because they actually did not have the financial means yeah, to go out there yeah, and, and go to, I don't know, a cafe or restaurant, take out their girlfriends. Yeah? So they were confined to a space that was free of use, yeah, which was their yard mm -hmm. yeah, to some degree. So that is something that defined them. Yeah? And everything evolved around the yard yeah, from there on. There was a very strong notion of solidarity and, and loyalty to your own yard, yeah? which mm -hmm. meant, for example, that you would support people from your yard. Yeah? They were your closest neighborhood brothers. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a brotherhood um, framing. And um, also the solidarity went from very small scale marginal things yeah, to the, for example, in, in Bishkek winter, which can go down to minus 20, minus 30 degrees Celsius. You were... Um, you were expected to step outside for half an hour, one hour, even during that time and not be lazy and sit on your couch and watch TV. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Very, very small, minor rituals yeah, of, of solidarity, but also the bigger picture and that you were referring mm -hmm. in the beginning to this introductory scene yeah, on the playground, yeah, which mm -hmm. was an evolving fight yeah, between um, one leader and, and rural migrants from, from the outside. Yeah? and who he was um, calling for help in that instance, yeah? who he was, um, whose mobile number he was dialing, yeah? who was then coming. And, and this was an, an actual act of solidarity, yeah? to be mm -hmm. ready to leave your job, I don't know, risk even being imprisoned yeah? for a street fight. So in that spectrum, yeah, this solidarity played out. Yeah? I think what also defined their, them being boys was that they were celebrating a time of friendship. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, there was a strong expectation that, let's say, until they reached the age of 25, 27, maybe the latest, yeah, for young men in Kyrgyz society, they should be married or already have children. Um, so they were still celebrating, yeah, this to be the time of boys, yeah, of men being together, hanging out in the yard. Yeah? You, you would definitely have to distinguish between uh, how they spoke about themselves uh, becoming men Mm -hmm. and how they acted uh, during that very same process, yeah. So you mentioned kind of the ties within, but also across these neighborhood boundaries. So, but, but there's, I think, kind of like a larger structural social argument that you're making in the book. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, I think what, uh, what is important is that uh, there were also ties that are residing in between the classic distinctions. Classic mm -hmm. distinctions would, for example, be between friendship and kinship. But if you look at one relationship that uh, was very important for these young men at the time of my fieldwork, it was neighborhood brothers. Yeah? And neighborhood brothers were clearly a category being in between yeah? in a very uh, interesting way because you would distinguish generations of these neighborhood brothers into younger and older neighborhood brothers and those who were of your age, which was plus one year from your birth age, minus one year from your birth age, yeah. Um, they were friends, those who were plus minus one from yourself, yeah. Um, but everything older or younger was a smaller or older neighborhood brother. And that was interesting because it fulfilled a function that was, that's usually associated with kinship or with friendship, yeah? And, and the kinship function would be that you could rely on that neighborhood brother uh, in very critical situations to a degree almost as if he was your relative. Mm -hmm. And what rather goes to the friendship domain is that at the same time, this person who would help you would not necessarily judge you to a degree as a parental authority would do, yeah? Mm -hmm. And if you look, just look at that, then you can see that there was a clearly positive social function uh, of these neighborhood brothers. Yeah? And at the same time within it, it was interesting to see that um, two people who are of different generations exchange different things. Yeah? So usually what would flow from the younger neighborhood brother to the older one was respect. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, maybe that would mean you, you go and pick up a beer or I don't know, some snacks for a store yeah? and you just bring it, maybe pay from your own money. You know? 
And the other thing would be that the older neighborhood brothers would clearly be uh, show responsibility for you yeah. in terms of getting you out of a troublesome situation, yeah, uh, giving you advice on, 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 I don't know, how to handle a certain situation. Yeah? And that, I think, was, was something very interesting for me because it clearly resided in between being friends. It had something of being friends and it at the same time had something of being uh, kin. Are there still neighborhood brothers today? I honestly couldn't say <laughs> because uh, as, as the Bishkek boys, um, I, I have moved on. Yeah. And yeah. Right. Of course. <laughs> I am research, I'm researching something else. And interestingly, the last time I spoke uh, to them about this, I mean, we, we're in, in regular contact. I see them at least once a year if mm -hmm. there is no uh, COVID uh, crisis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They have moved on also to the degree that the last time I, walked through the neighborhood with one of the former leaders, which was in 2018, I think. Um, I was asking him about something very particular. Yeah? And I said, oh, what happened here? And he said, well, I don't know. <laughs> right. And that was, an, uh, that was a, just unimaginable yeah, during the time of my field work. He would have known everything mm -hmm. to the detail. And now he was part of the rumor machine as, as anyone. Yeah? Mm -hmm as the grandma from the first floor. Yeah? So, right. so he was detached from, from what was going on on a daily basis in this neighborhood mm -hmm. um, as I was. And um, so in that case, we all have moved on and we're still connected in, in moving on. Phil Schroeder, thank you so much uh, for being a part of Salon B and for sharing your work with us. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Я сам выбрал для себя эту дорогу, когда родители ждали чего-то другого, а я упрямо хотел больше свободы, больше действий. And now, a message from Girlhood Studies, an interdisciplinary journal from Berghahn Books, published under the auspices of the International Girl Studies Association. Hi, this is Pamela Lamb and Julia Lehman. And together we host the Girlhood Studies podcast. Girlhood Studies, an international journal, is a peer-reviewed journal providing a forum for the critical discussion of girlhood. The editor-in-chief is Claudia Mitchell, and the managing editor is Anne Smith. Both are from McGill University in Canada. International and interdisciplinary in scope, the journal is committed to feminist, anti-discrimination, and anti-oppression approaches. It was the winner of the 2009 Prose Award for Best New Journal in the Social Sciences and Humanities from the Association of American Publishers Awards for Professional and Scholarly Excellence. The Girlhood Studies podcast supports the journal's work of addressing the research to practice gap by translating research findings into oral storytelling for new audiences. In thought-provoking conversations, we ask scholars to reflect on the relevance of their research in order to produce meaningful and memorable takeaways. In this monthly conversation, we explore themes related to girls' lives from the perspectives of girls themselves and members of their communities. We engage in heartfelt and humorous storytelling about girls' creative initiatives around the world. For example, in the episode Falling for Roller Derby, we talked with two high-ranking players about their inspiring community and how they are role models for the girls' junior league. I really fell in love with the community. We're sharing this, uh, this love of the sport, but it's not only the love of the sport, it's the love of the organization and the culture of the sport because it has a very unique culture to it. Most of the kids that go there, they say, I, I have always hated sports, but this one I like. It's a community, it's friends, it's a place where you feel just, you can just be yourself. It's amazing how you've created this league by yourself without relying on external structures. There must be a great sense in, of ownership in that. Yes, and to see you can create things that you're passionate about, where the interest lays more in the community and this feeling of pure joy and not just some profits. There's a lot of diversity in roller derby. It's a sport that's promoted as being body positive, inclusive of gender, racial, sexual diversity. Could you speak to that? Like, you can be a tiny person. Like, we have tiny, yeah. tiny people that are incredible blockers because they can get so low, or incredible jammers because they're so agile and they can find the holes to get through. Or, 
you can you can have a bigger stature and be a, a great solid blocker as well. So every body type and, and shape like brings something. There is no like uh, ideal like oh you should to excel in this sport you have to look like this and 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 fit in this kind of box. So, so it I think it's a sport where a great variety of people can can get can progress very far in it and can offer something different, like bring bring some true value to, to their team and their position. In other episodes, we explore collaborative forms of leadership and being brave even when scared and talents in the arts, sports, and science. We also reflect on girlhood and critical issues like education and health and representation in popular culture. Listen to the Girlhood Studies podcast and be inspired by all the creative, playful, and empowering ways girls can be girls. Up next, we have Lorna Field, our digital strategy manager, talking with Sean Eady, author of Four Color Communism, Comic Books and Contested Power in the German Democratic Republic, due for publication in February 2021. In this interview, they touch on the nature of East German comic books and their use as educational tools. I'm Lorna Field, a digital strategy manager for the publisher, and I'm here with Sean Eady, the author of Four Color Communism. Hi, Sean. Hi. Good to meet you. Tell us a little bit more about this book. It it started life as just my my own efforts to find out about uh socialist comic books um comics were something that i grew up with and i loved as a child um for the stories as much as the experience of them when i was digging around for uh ideas for my dissertation i was curious if east germany had superheroes Really, I wanted to know if East Germany had the equivalent of the X-Men or Spider-Man or one of the other heroes that I grew up with. Turns out, no. Um, but I did find that they, the comics that Socialist East Germany did have uh, did share a lot of themes and stylistic elements that we're we're very familiar with in comics in the west in, in the book uh, i i talk about that and i talk about um how these comics were used by the regime as as educational tools um and also how how they were interpreted and understood by the children reading them um the the children weren't necessarily as willing to engage with these comics in the same way that uh, the regime understood them when they created them. So what I wanted to do was approach it kind of from both sides um, as those uh, state sanctioned uh, political educational tools, as well as uh, the the more familiar uh escapist children's literature that that the kids would have understood them as tell me a little bit more about these comics and how or if they evolved at all from the early days of the gdr well through the 1980s probably the most well and widely known of these comics was uh mosaic von hannes hagen and uh, that one started in December of 1955, uh, really as uh, as the response to uh, Disney's comics, which were uh, popularized in in West Germany and accessible to those children in the East because of a lack of a hard border before the Berlin Wall. So with with Mosaic, the state really wanted to create a comic that was uh, like a socialist answer to Mickey. They created a, a trio of characters, uh, not unlike Huey, Dewey, and Louie. And these characters 
their origins were kind of unexplained for the longest time, but uh, they they had the ability to move through time and space, uh, sometimes magically, um, sometimes it was just left entirely unexplained. But uh, they would travel around and have these adventures with, uh, again, treasure hunts and uh, on pirate ships. And in the early days, um, that comic maybe reflected the Western influence a little too much. And it was criticized by the regime for uh, being a little too capitalist, um, for not having enough uh, ideology embedded in the stories. So by the mid-60s, the comics started getting uh, more ideology injected into those stories. But with Mosaic, it was still, it was still relatively minimal. Um, in order to maintain its own popularity, they had to kind of uh, scale back the amount of ideology put into these comics if they wanted the children to keep reading it. The only other comic of significance uh, and, and when I say comic, I mean uh, a dedicated comic book that we think of in the West. Uh, they, had, they had a number of children's magazines and publications that had comic strips in them, but uh, proper comic books, there were only the two. So there was Mosaic, and the other one was Atze. And Atze was more of an anthology-type comic. And... That one, once once uh, Wolfgang Altenberger came in as the editor in chief on that, that comic was really where all of the ideology went. Uh, in the early days, it was kind of a distant, distant second to Mosaic uh, in terms of popularity and in quality. But when uh, Altenberger came in and uh, reinvigorated the title. It became the go-to comic for uh, stories of political nature, uh, starring socialist heroes and martyrs like Ernst Talman and uh, Lenin. It had adaptations of uh, Western novels uh, by authors like Jules Verne. And it was where uh, a lot of that propagandistic, ideological, uh, political, educational material was found. And there were, there were little stories in there that uh, tried to educate children as to how they were supposed to act as, as good socialist citizens, to, to develop that socialist personality that would see them succeed in East Germany. So from 1955, uh, really it's, it's Mosaic with Atze distant, but by the mid 60s, uh, Atze grows in importance. As the two comics kind of run parallel through the 70s and 80s, Mosaic is the comic with the more more traditional westernized style stories and i'd say is that other book that never quite has the same degree of popularity but it it allows the regime to at least make the claim that these books are are conducive to uh childhood development and to their own those children's own development as as socialist citizens. How are East German children consuming these? Is it like purely out of leisure or are they using them in school? A little bit of both. Um, generally, these comics were were digested in leisure time. And in that instance, uh, from the state's perspective, uh, these comics were seen as a, a means by which the state could organize leisure time 
that was largely going unorganized by uh, the children's parents, uh, by the children's time in school, or by the children's own participation in the East German youth group. Uh, comics were a means to remind children of the socialist society in which they lived, even when they weren't actively participating in that. The regime actively promoted uh, discussion of the, the more political comics in, in the classroom. From the children's own, own standpoint, uh, they used uh, letters to the comics editors as, as a space to talk about what they were learning in school, some of the, the projects that were adopted in the classroom, uh, like preparations for the uh, visit of Angela Davis in 68 or 1969. These comics were uh, consumed in leisure time. But the the editors, the creators, uh, East German educators did promote that that link between uh, comics and leisure time and comics in the classroom, using the classroom as a space in which to discuss the political stories and their implications for the children reading them. As I said, um, children were also using these comics as as a space to vent their concerns about the classroom uh, but also uh, describe for the editors describe for the regime what they enjoyed about the classroom in the u.s i feel like a lot of comics even back in the 50s and 60s were consumed by both adults and children like, were there any adults reading these types of comics or was it purely kids and maybe teenagers? Yeah, largely, largely these were being consumed by children um, up until about the age of 13. Though in the uh, documentation, there is a suggestion from the, the editor, editorial regime that sometimes older children or even young adults were still reading these. Unlike in North America, where we've, we've kind of outgrown that stigma attached to comics, in East Germany and, and still in Germany, comics are very much considered a, a medium for children. It's a medium that kids it's fine if they read them when they're young but it is something they are going to outgrow i know that you mentioned that some of these were a little bit influenced by western comics but i'm curious if you can give me an example or two of the types of stories in these like is it just the classic hero fighting against evil type thing or let's start with an example from mosaic the the probably the two biggest series had were the the space series and the America series. With the with the space series, the Digadags, the the trio of characters in this story, are taken off into space, where they encounter a couple of alien races involved in an interstellar cold war the uh, Neotian Reich and uh, Neotian Republic. It's not, it's not so much good versus evil in the superhero sense of it. Um, superheroes were too individualistic for socialist comics. What, what happens in the, uh, the space series is the Digadags always, always acting as, as a group. They are befriended by the Republic, kind of stand-ins for the Soviet Union. And they are whisked off into space as kind of uh, avatars for the reader. And they're taught about space travel, they're taught about alien planets. And when they come into conflict with this uh, Neotian Reich, this Neotian Empire, usually it's in terms of uh, espionage. 
there is a, a spy aboard the Republican spaceship. It, again, it, it's used for socialist ideological educational purposes, uh, attempting to teach children to be on guard against imperialist threat, um, to be wary of potential sabotage within socialist society. The stories typically are more about discovery than they are about conflict. In the case of Atze, um, being an anthology, there were a lot of different types of stories being told with, with some of the stories geared towards the pioneer youth groups. Um, there were stories about, uh, say, a group of pioneers going to uh, ask neighbors for recyclable material. And in doing this, they stumbled across an unexploded bomb in one of their neighbor's backyards left over from the, world, the Second World War. So then the story became uh, about who were they supposed to contact to take this away. And then with the, the proper authorities showing up to dispose of this unexploded bomb, it became more educational about the number of bombs dropped on Germany during the war and how many people die from unexploded munitions every year since the war. The stories being told aren't so much uh, what we've come to know as conflicts of good versus evil. I'm curious if there was any type of backlash to this, like either kids sneaking in Western comics or publishing alternative comics or underground comics. Yeah, well, in the early days before the borders became hard and fast, bringing in comics from the Western zones wasn't unheard of. Once the Berlin Wall went up, once the border between East and West became more more concrete bringing comics in became much more difficult as far as like an underground comics movement because the uh, machinery needed to reproduce comics uh, was largely monitored by the state there wasn't as significant an underground comics movement as there was in the west that's not to say there wasn't any at all I've I've just started doing research recently uh, into uh, an, an underground comics movement. It turns out that with the human rights movements and the environmental movements in East Germany in the mid 1980s, they began finding their way into East Germany from the West and writers and artists associated with the environmental library began publishing their own comics. Because the typewriters, copy machines, printing presses are, are largely monitored, uh, it's, it's not a huge movement and it, it's not as though everybody can do it. So when you began your career, did you see yourself more focusing on history and historic studies or comic studies? Yeah, well, I, I'm, I am a trained historian. So most of what I write, I, I approach from that historical standpoint. W when I started, I, I never imagined I'd be doing comic book studies, but uh, now I'm a number of years into it. And uh, if, if they want to think of me as the East German comic book guy, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Thank you for taking time to be on our podcast. I feel like this book is pretty uniquely positioned between history and comic studies, that it's kind of a unique contribution to both fields. I certainly hope so. Thanks for having me. Timothy Sherry is the author of numerous books on youth and film. And next year, we will be publishing his new edited collection called Cinemas of Boyhood, Masculinity, Sexuality, Nationality. We are pleased to welcome him to the podcast today as he shares with us his top five films about boyhood 
with our Associate Editor for Film and Media Studies, Amanda Horn. Hi, Tim. Thank you for being here with us today. Sure. Uh, Thanks so, for having me. Yeah, our pleasure. You've pulled together a list of the five most important American movies about boyhood from the 21st century. Uh, I wonder, what was your rubric for picking these particular films? Like, what was what was the criteria here? It's, of course, difficult to pick just five from the many hundreds. But I was thinking not only movies about boys, boys at different ages, boys of different uh, class and race backgrounds, uh, boys with different gender identities. Overall, I was looking for diversity, but also significance in the sense that I wanted these films to be uh, popular, to mm -hmm. be important, mm -hmm. and to be representative. So when you say for these movies to be important, are we talking about like good movies or in terms of cultural impact or something else? I think the five movies that I've selected are all good movies in the sense that just about anyone would enjoy watching them. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, although I know they all have their detractors as well for different reasons, but important in the sense that they, they all make significant statements about boys over the past 20 years, whether it's in terms of style, politics, sexuality, uh, and attitudes around being a young, being a boy in America. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I guess let's take a look at the first film here. The first film would be Napoleon Dynamite from 2004. Hey, Napoleon, what'd you do all last summer again? I told you, I spent it with my uncle in Alaska hunting wolverines. Did you shoot any? Yes, like 50 of them. They kept trying to attack my cousins. What the heck would you do in a situation like that? This is a film that, that really was a sleeper hit because it didn't have any big name actors in it. It had a very low budget. It was shot in Idaho. And at the time in, in 2004, there, there wasn't a very thriving teen market in the movies. And so for this film to gain the attention that it did, especially on video in, in its, after its release, was really quite significant. Napoleon Dynamite is a movie about the awkwardness of adolescence from a boy's perspective who is in a broken family, or at least the father is missing. It's not entirely clear how. It's a relatable film in a lot of ways for boys who don't get along with their families, who are trying to find a sense of their identities, and yet they're doing it in a way that's not dramatic or violent or even all that sexual, it's just really kind of hilariously pathetic in a, in a certain way, mm -hmm. uh, but, but pathetic in the sense that it's full of pathos also. You know, it's not mm -hmm. sad, mm -hmm. it's humorously awkward. Right, and I mean, even just in that clip, we sort of hear him, you know, weaving this fantasy, this, this fantasy of masculinity, you know? Yes, um, that's, that's what he's up against. And you're right, he wants to have this vision of himself as a tough guy, which is why he takes up karate. You know, as a boy, I think Napoleon is rather representative, but in a, in a truly unexpected way, because he's not your traditional confident, aggressive, or even all that assertive young man he's really uh he's really faking his his sense of confidence it's very easy to see through it's very easy to understand that he just doesn't have a great sense of himself but he's going to keep trying anyway right very relatable i think for a yeah, lot of people <laughs> yeah, not, not just young boys in that regard either you know uh, a right. lot of people point out that the film contains no swearing no overt sexual act activity or content, no alcohol, no drugs. Some people have credited this to being to its, the fact that it's made by a largely Mormon uh, crew and uh, production company. But I, I think it just also actually helped the film sell better in, in, the, in many ways. It made it more universal. So let's take a look at the second film we have here. The second film will be Super Bad from 2007. I love you. I'm not even embarrassed to say it. I just, 
I, lo- I love you. I'm not embarrassed. Love you. I love you. It's like, why don't we say that every day? Why can't we say it more often? I just love you. I just want to go to the rooftops and scream, I love my best friend, Evan. We should go up on my roof. For sure. Like, when you went away for Easter on your vacation, I'm like, I missed you. I missed you, too. I want the world to know. It's, it's, it's the most beautiful thing in the world. Super Bad was a film that had a lot of great hype behind it when it came out because Judd Apatow, the producer, one of the producers, was coming off the success of previous films like Knocked Up. And this was a genuine return to the old sex romp comedies that were popular in the 1980s and had really faded away by the 90s. And it's what I would call the sex quest plot, where boys are off on a journey to try to not only get girls and make it to the big party, but also acquire alcohol along the way and supposedly validate their machismo. And, um, they, of course, get in all kinds of trouble and have numerous miscommunications, and we certainly anticipate that the girls aren't going to see things the same ways that the boys do. But because the boys are so overconfident and full of hormonal preapic <laughs> fixations, <laughs> they, you know, it makes for great comedy. And there's three different male boys of of each of a different style to create a a diversity of perspective. They're all three white high school boys, but they do have really different uh, backgrounds and attitudes in certain ways. Right, right. And this, you know, this movie very much kind of channels like uh, Animal House, you know, or um, a lot of those like earlier, earlier films are kind of called back to. Yes. The, the, in the early eighties, the industry realized that for a low budget, you could cast relatively inexpensive actors on inexpensive sets, just chase, not much unlike the beach movies of the 60s, just chasing a good time, more sexualized than they had been before, and uh, usually confronting issues around their sexual development and being more candid about it. And then that really faded by the end of the 80s when it became evident that the spread of AIDS was a, was a heterosexual threat, unlike it had been seen in the early part of the decade. The teenage pregnancy rate was going up. And I think that the moral coding of the Reagan and later Bush era really made it just less appealing to be so sexually frivolous with children. Even in the clip that we heard, the vulnerability there. I mean, it's humorous, but there's also a lot of vulnerability. Yes. Um, Boys are being able to express more emotional vulnerability and sensitivity and insecurity. It takes the boys both the, if you will, the lubrication of alcohol and the passage of, of a lot of their delusions to finally get to be more expressive. And uh, the, the later films that we're going to talk about, I think, embrace that even more. So that's kind of a great segue to the next film. Well, the next film would be Boyhood from 2014. Happy birthday. (gasps) Happy birthday! Mason, it's your birthday? Uh, Just now, I guess. Yeah, how old are you? (laughs) Fifteen. (laughs) Fifteen. Give me a hug. Happy birthday. Oh, my goodness. Have you been drinking? Have you? Yeah, a little. Have you? A little bit. So this is uh, markedly different. Um, Oh, yes. (laughs) Boyhood, in many ways, is one of the most radical films in movie history, and I don't mean to be too dramatic about it, but it was made over 12 years, in short segments to really show the literal growth of its main character and in consequence all of the actors who are in the film and Richard Linklater who wrote in and designed the film and directed it he knew that he this was a big risk when he started in in 2002 just after 9-11 
He was casting a six-year-old Eller Coltrane as as the main character. His daughter was playing his slightly older sister. And he did have two recognized stars in Patricia Arquette and Ethan Hawke to play the, the mother and father. But he still didn't know what was going to happen in 12 years as time went on and these people aged and how the story might change, how American politics might change. And he ended up with a film that really follows the 12 years of schooling for this main character. Uh, Mason is the character's name. And it, I just think it's one of the most extraordinary documents of youth in general. And granted, it's one, again, one white boy's working class experience entirely in Texas. He doesn't really travel and he doesn't have a great diversity of experience, but it's certainly in, it's certainly insightful on in so many levels. One of its main criticisms is that with a title as broad as boyhood, it should be even more representative, that it should feature even more significant moments in the 12 years of this boy's life. But Linklater said himself that he didn't want the film to feature a lot of rituals and firsts and turning points that would you would see in so many other dramatic tales. He does go through, of course, crushes. He has his first serious girlfriend. She ends up breaking his heart. But we don't see, for instance, him losing his virginity. We don't see the first time he ever tries alcohol. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't we don't mm -hmm. have a lot of the first moments that so many people seem to think of as being important in the dramatic retelling of our lives. One of the prevailing issues that so many pe so many critics have, and I think viewers too, is that nothing really happens. People say he just ages for 12 years over three hours, and in the end, he's still just a confused teenager. Well, I say, of course, you know, he he's just starting college at the end of the movie. And for anyone who's just starting college, you know, you hardly know a thing. You're just glad to be out of high school. You're just glad that you <laughs> made it. You made it to college. And at the mm -hmm. end of the movie, he's his, on his first day of college. He's met a nice girl and he's got the world ahead of him. And so right. I, I find it a very, a, yes, it's, it's it's not a dramatic film. It's very open ended and uh, maybe, uh, you know, it's not as you know, narratively satisfying as other movies, but I find it very poignant. Wonderful. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the next film on the list. The next film in the list is Moonlight from 2016. All right, uh, straight up, straight up. I'm trapping. What? Yeah. When they sent me to Atlanta, with me straight in the Jew for beating the old boy. Met this dude in there. When I come out, he put me on the block. Did good at it and rose up. That's what it is. That ain't what it is. That ain't you, Sharon. This is a, this is a very poignant scene toward the end of the film where Sharon is still young. He's probably by this point in his early twenties, but we've seen him grow up through his earlier childhood and then his teens, trying to make sense of his life in Miami in 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 a very uh, impoverished part of Miami, with a, a mother who's a drug addict and a father figure mentor who's a drug dealer yet at the same time also slowly discovering he likes boys and that is is really i think what a lot what gets a lot of attention about the movie because it, it's one of the few films to actually look at well there have been more over time but there there really weren't many films looking at gay and lesbian youth until this past decade a few but there really weren't many and now i would mm -hmm. say at least there's a, a much greater number you know this um this movie sort of approaches a lot bigger issues i mm -hmm. guess than the other ones you know the the context here is a much more complicated context you know this world is a much more complicated world than we necessarily see in Napoleon Dynamite. It's got much greater gravity. You you understand the stakes are much higher because Chiron really can't let anyone else know about his sexual preference. Mm -hmm. And it's more of that like vulnerability, you know, this kind of heartbreaking vulnerability 
yes. And this is a film that really puts the male vulnerability out there, even though by the end of the film, Chiron is trying to deny that. He's doing his best with his car and his attitude and his look and his, his, I think the delivery of the lines there is poignant too, because he's speaking in that slow, quiet, almost imperceptible tone that makes him non-committal in his emotions Mm -hmm. because he doesn't want to he doesn't want to expose himself in that way until the very final shot of the film which i guess i i won't spoil for anyone but i think the (laughs) the film has a very powerful final shot that gives you this glimmer of hope that he will indeed kind of be liberated if only through going back to visit his old friend so uh the final movie the last movie on the list and the most recent would be Good Boys from just last year in 2019. Can I help you? Good afternoon. We would like to buy two pieces of Molly, please. <laughs> did Rafi from Sigma Nu send you? <laughs> he did that. F- you guys are like seven. Seriously, I'm not selling drugs to kids. We're not kids, we're tweens. Who told you to come here? Sells the drugs and you'll find out. Uh, you played my favorite line. We're not kids, we're tweens. <laughs> it is the oh, declaration. Okay. It is the declaration of every junior high student, right? It's just like, no, I'm almost there. <laughs> <laughs> what I think makes good boys refreshing is that it ultimately deals with issues of empowerment for, as, as the Jacob Tremblay character says, for tweens, really for boys on the, on the very beginning edge of adolescence who are looking for a sense of authority and uh, a, a sense of confidence, but, are, but, but have no idea how to discover it. They're not even sure what acts to put on Whereas I think a lot of older boys by you know 15 or by the middle of high school have embraced whatever acts they feel work for them. It's a very transitional period that is sort of like easy to overlook in people's life just because it is so kind of like formative, you know, uh, malleable and changing. Absolutely. I And I think that's what's rather remarkable about tween movies. And there there are actually quite a few because... It is that liminal phase between childhood and adolescence, just as adolescence is itself is a liminal phase between childhood and adulthood, where the tween is close enough to being adolescent that he or she is is asking for a little bit more authority, a little bit more responsibility. And yet, as we see in this movie, when they all start to disagree and come into conflict toward the end, all the all three boys end up crying. They actually have a big <laughs> cry. And it's something that I think probably only 11 or 12 year olds would do. I'm sure that after about 13 or 14 boys just wouldn't cry, at least not in front of each other. Right, right. You know, we're just, we're seeing more, more variety in the kind of protagonists and, uh, you know, a lot of different kinds of stories. I agree. And if I can just simply mention a few of the other films that were close to my my consideration for this list of important boyhood movies, I, I think of something like Hugo from 2011, which had a massive budget and was directed by Martin Scorsese, one of the biggest directors in America. And 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 yet, of course, entirely a fantasy set in France and meant to be. A, a deliberately classic film, and I just felt that while it was so grand and so beautiful, it was also a little too unrealistic to have on this list. Mm. You know, all the all the films that I've chosen are films that are about relatively realistic, what you would call familiar teenage characters. Whereas something like Spider Man, the first one in two thousand two, now there's they're on their third different version of Spider the third different <laughs> franchise of Spider Man is mm-hmm. ha- is happening now in less than twenty years. And of course it's you know rather unrealistic. It deals with some familiar teen adolescent awkward aspects, but it's just unrealistic. 
um, and and yet uh, I also uh, was thinking of movies like Love Simon from a couple years ago in 2018, which was the supposed first studio film to feature a, a gay protagonist uh, teenage character, and um, then I also uh, appreciated movies like The Perks of Being a Wallflower, which mm-hmm. also dealt with uh, levels of uh, mental health among youth and a gay versus a gay boy. But um, the the real, I think the real background of a film like that is in its appreciation of the fleeting nature of adolescence, which mm-hmm. many, uh, many a great movie about children tries to uh, depict and, and recognize. Right. So these films and more are featured in your upcoming book, Cinemas of Boyhood, Masculinity, Sexuality, Nationality, many contributions of which were originally featured in two special issues of the journal Boyhood Studies. And thanks again, Tim. Well, thank you. This was a lot of fun, of course. To close the episode, we have the poet Sarah James, author of four poetry collections with a fifth due from Schaffinch Press later next year. Here she reads her poem, Another Shell, first published in Critical Survey. Another Shell The first time I noticed the shortfall, I didn't understand why my father's heartbeat was a big pebble, bashed against the sea wall while my mother's barely pulsed. Sandlogged, my head rested heavy as a stone on her lap. Waves fell to slack around us. Their tides in my blood made me this brittled shape, with a sharp brine crust and hollowed space. But put your ear to my shell and softness echoes. From a cold rush then spill the lullaby of moon rhythms. Hold me gently, and I will take whatever grit life gives me. A reminder that all of today's featured books can be found on our website, www.berghanbooks.com. And the poem can be read in volume 29, issue 3 of the journal Critical Survey. If you would like to submit a poem for the journal, you can email criticalsurveypoetry at gmail.com. To stay up to date with Salon B, visit berkonbooks.com slash podcast or find us wherever you get your podcasts, including Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher. We've got plenty of interesting content coming up over the next few months, So please subscribe. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Salon B and thank you for listening.